Okay, so we're going to finish up a bit now. We remember from, the, from um, our earlier session about the issues about the environment, the importance of the environment in infection transmission, and therefore the importance of the environment in preventing infection. That whole idea of ensuring that our healthcare workers are able to do the job that we want them to do and that we evaluate the effectiveness of practice. So we want to again then start about um, thinking about those elements and what we would put in a bundle. And we talked about the importance of the actual product that we use. So somehow in our bundle of activities, we need to make sure that individuals that work in our department are able to not only select, but they need to be able to mix and use the correct germicide according to whatever your facility policy has. So your facility policy has to outline when to use what. So your, your personnel have to be able to do that. They need to be able to identify surfaces and items that are in need of cleaning and disinfection. They need to be able to select and use personal protective equipment, both to protect themselves and to make sure then that they are not involved in transmission. They need to be able to clean and disinfect surfaces using a correct technique. And remember, there's plenty of different types of techniques, but you've got to commit to one or a couple and make sure that they are reflected in your policy. They need to be able to identify and then know what to do if they identify a breach in infection prevention. So if somebody's doing something incorrectly, they need to be able to recognize that and then know what to do. And they need to know what needs to happen in order to prevent infection in self and in others. So these are the elements of a bundle um, of practices that are specific to, in, to uh, infection prevention and environmental services. All right, so let's look at each one of these specifically. And I want to get feedback from you because we'll be taking some of this and then adding this to our um, toolkit that we will be working to develop. So items that you feel like are not important or maybe items that are important but are not included, um, I really need for your feedback to help make sure that uh, this is at least on the right track. So when we think about selecting, mixing, and using the correct germicide, we need to make sure that we've got the right bug product combination. Just like when we're treating an infection, we talk about the right bug and the right drug. Here, we need to make sure that we've got the right combination between the organisms that you are likely to see in your facility and the products that are available. We also need to make sure that the personnel are able to mix or dilute the product correctly. So if you just tell them, you know, add a couple of splashes or a cup full, it's probably not going to be as effective as if you have some kind of a fill station process. But you want to make sure that whatever process you have, that it is able to be accurate time after time after time. So if you can, you can have the best product in the world, but if the equipment that you are, are using um, to actually cause you and help you mix, if that is a non-functional, or if it is inconsistent, then it can't be a workable solution for you. They also need to understand the right preparation of the surface. So that means they need to be able to, to clean adequately before they disinfect. So, or clean and disinfect if you are, if you are performing that at the same time, if the product that you're using allows you to do that. So make sure that they know what that means. So all, like all surfaces need to come in contact with the germicide. Um, are we using the right um, equipment to make sure that we can get the right contact time? So if we want that surface to have a contact time of one minute, as we talked about this morning, um, are we using the right product to enable you to keep that surface wet for one minute? Now, I would tell you, um, if you look at a surface and uh, you think it's been wet for a minute, a minute is a long time, okay? So make sure that as part of your process, you're actually testing to make sure that your delivery of the product enables that surface to have that contact time that is consistent with your policy. So if you say a contact time for a minute, use your, your methods to actually test and use your second hand to make sure that um, the delivery of that product with whatever cleaning cloths or, or your delivery method, make sure that it actually um, can happen. You have to verify that. All right, so those are the bundle elements for selecting, missing, mixing, and using a correct germicide. Right product, right dilution, right preparation, 
write product application, and write product contact time. So I'll ask you to think, and you may want to make notes if you can think of something that we need to add. We can certainly do that. All right, the next uh, domain or the next competency statement is that the individual can identify surfaces and items that are in need of cleaning and disinfection. So they need to know, in your particular facility, what are the high-touch surfaces? What is frequently touched, and are they the same thing? Have you identified that, for example, every day we clean high-touch surfaces? That doesn't mean high in, you know, high up vertically. That just means these high-touch, often-touch surfaces. And does that differ from frequently touch surfaces that we may not clean every day. You have to identify this and determine this in your policy and in your procedures. You have to make sure that you identify what are critical items. So are there items in that room that must be cleaned and disinfected every day? If so, what are they? Um, are they included in your protocols? Do you identify items that need to be clean, the clean daily or disinfected daily versus those that need to be done when visibly soiled? Now, what's a good example of something that you would maybe make a determination to clean it when it's visibly soiled? Yeah, your curtains, right. So what, what do you have in that, in your system where you may say, we have a routine of changing or cleaning cubicle curtains um, at some particular interval. Well, outline specifically what that interval is and then make sure that that interval is adequate. If you say when visibly soiled, what does that mean? And are your personnel able to determine when it's visibly soiled? Is there a clear delineation of responsibilities with respect to certain items? So, for example, have you decided who's responsible for what? Again, remember that something that is everybody's job is nobody's job. So if you say, well, everybody goes in the, the staff uh, lounge or the pantry or the nutrition statement in a patient care area, everybody goes in there, so they'll just handle it, and they will know when items need to be cleaned. I can pretty much guarantee you, you'll find, you know, eggs that have been cooked onto that microwave about three years ago, and it has never been cleaned. So negotiate with uh, the area and that, you know, remember you're, that you nor your department are there to clean up after people's messes. That if this is your work home, there are some shared, uh, some places that have shared responsibility. So negotiate that. Make out that chart or that grid that says who's responsible for what and that you've got to periodically evaluate that. And if somebody's not getting it done, then it needs to go to the attention of whatever process you have determined. But that whole, that brings in that whole notion of teamwork and responsibility. That you work together, but everybody is accountable for their, their portion of the job. So when you bring things out and have them in writing so that they are clearly out in some sort of a policy or procedure that has been vetted by all those involved and has been agreed upon, then, you know, no fair reneging on the argument, right? It's everybody's responsibility for ensuring that they are holding up their end of the bargain. All right, what about selecting and using PPE according to facility policy? And I put facility policy because you will have a variety of personnel who may or may not be able to make a decision about whether or not PPE is appropriate. And you don't want them to, to be making a, a decision if they are not capable, if they don't have the, the knowledge or the skill or the background to make that decision. So you've got to determine in policy when protective per, uh, equipment should be used and what that protective equipment is. So when do you use gloves and what type of gloves do you use? Do you use the same type of glove to protect your hands regardless of the task that you're doing or you have some episodes where you want individuals to wear utility gloves and then some episodes where they will wear the exam gloves? You certainly want to minimize the use of latex gloves, right? That should not be your primary glove. Um, so determine what type of glove you use and when you use it. When do you use gowns or when do you use the aprons? Um, should you be using one or the other or both um, uh, in some situations? So outline specifically the types of PPE to use and when to use it. What about other barriers such as masks? or respirators for respiratory protection. When are individuals supposed to wear masks? 
and when are they supposed to wear respirators. This is a policy that should be developed clearly in conjunction with infection prevention, but make sure then that policy is clear, that the signage is clear, that the signage also reflects the cultural diversity that may be present in your workplace. So um, a lot of words and a lot of verbiage generally does not work well with isolation signs now that having pictures that are large enough to see and are easily able to be differentiated. So you can clearly tell the difference between a mask and a respirator. Um, and then testing again, monitoring to make sure that um, the signs or the policies actually work. Your staff need to know if you're going to be asking them or requiring that they wear protective equipment, do they know how to put it on and do they know how to take it off? And that's very important because we know that the order in which protective equipment is removed may uh, play a role in disease transmission. So do they know that you always take off your dirtiest piece of protective equipment first? So what is generally our dirtiest piece of protective equipment? Our gloves. Our, if you have on gloves and any other protective equipment, your gloves should come off first. When you remove your gloves, you take them off, you throw them in the designated waste receptacle, and then what do you do? Cleanse your hands, right? Whether you're washing with soap and water or using an alcohol-based hand rub, but as soon as you remove your gloves, make sure that you perform hand hygiene. Then you can begin to remove other pieces of protective equipment. But gloves first. And when I teach this, I try to keep it simple, and I say we're going to go alphabetically. So we do gloves first, and then we do gowns. Right, so gloves first and then gowns, okay? So you can keep those, those two things separately. Because for some reason, people seem to want to take their gown off first. But gloves first and then their gown. All right, they need to know how to dispose of it, where to dispose of it, what needs to go in regulated medical waste and what needs to go in the regular trash. So that means you need to know not only what is the federal law, but you need to know what your state laws are um, with respect to PPE disposal. Yes? You can put in that every piece of PPE you, that you remove that um, perform hand hygiene between all of those, but we know the gloves are the worst and it is difficult, if not impossible, to take your gloves off without contaminating your hands, but it is possible to take your gown off uh, with minimal contamination. You're moving, removing it from the shoulders, you know, and then pulling it down and then balling it up. But you can say and have that in your policy, but I would negotiate that with infection prevention. The more steps you write into your procedure, the more likely you are to have error. So you may want to pick that that is the most important. Now, when you're done taking off all your PPE, wash your hands or cleanse your hands again um, at the end of the removal. But always um, wash them or cleanse them after you remove your gloves. They also need to know when do they restock, how do they restock, where do they get new supplies, and to let them know that you don't go into a room, if you're supposed to wear PPE and you don't have any, you don't go in the room without it. You know, there needs to be some emergency that is occurring. And if there is an emergency that is occurring, it is probably not an emergency that the, that the environmental services personnel are going to be responsible for. Will probably be some of the direct caregivers, like the physicians or the nurses. Okay, so if they don't have the PPE they need, don't go in the room. Make sure that they restock and resupply uh, so you don't put them at risk. Right? So again, keep notes if you think about items that need to be added or that you would suggest. All right, again, make sure that as you are describing personal protective equipment that your staff know what you're talking about. So not only that you have visuals, but also that you have demonstrations. So if you expect them to put on and take off PPE correctly, you need to have them do it. Right, you need to have role playing so that they know how to put it on and take it off and they can tell you, I would dispose of this here. I would put it over here in regulated waste under these conditions so that they can uh, actually demonstrate what they need. If there are items um, that are used as protective equipment, remember that the law requires, OSHA requires, that they be made available. So you can't tell someone that, well, at this place you have to buy your own eye protection. 
uh, that you may have staff that say, I'll, I only want to wear, you know, purple eye protection because, you know, anything else mars my natural beauty. Or I did have someone tell me once, I cannot wear those goggles because I am trying to catch me a husband and I will never catch one if I wear those goggles. Well, you know, okay, but I'm not buying you a set, different set of PPE just so, you know, I can get you to the marriage mart. Um, if you don't want to wear what we provide, then you will have to purchase your own. But they also then are responsible for maintenance, um, unfortunately. So, you know, we don't want to get into that. Who's got to take care of it and who's responsible? So, you know, make available as you're considering your, your PPE. Make sure that you are purchasing what your staff will be most likely to wear, um, although I realize it's not a, a fashion statement. I've never seen anybody who... I uh, thought what I, what I would say is particularly hot in PPE, but I guess maybe uh, there is some, uh, perhaps. Also make sure that the PPE is relevant to the work that they're going to do. If you want them to use utility gloves or thicker types of gloves or gloves for uh, contact with chemicals, then you've got to make it available. Also, the CDC has some really nice posters that actually show how to put on and how to take off personal protective equipment. It's in English and Spanish, and it's available on the CDC website. Uh, these kinds of visuals, I think, are, are nice because they've been developed um, by individuals who are responsible for health literacy, meaning that they can convey the message to individuals in a manner that uh, makes health-related information easy to understand. Um, so these are, again, available uh, free of choice. It tells them, again, how to put it on, how to take it off in a step-by-step -step, uh, fashion. So I think these are, are very helpful to have available. Also, a next bundle element is uh, to clean and disinfect surfaces using correct techniques. So you have to get very basic. Um, again, I was in a facility not too long ago, and they were having a big old C. difficile outbreak. Um, I went to the facility, watched uh, the cleaning, and they were very diligently cleaning dirty to clean. Um, in their mind, someone told them you should clean the commode first because that's the dirtiest item in the room of a patient with C. diff. That's probably true, uh, but then what happens? Well, they're bringing potentially organisms um, and uh, uh, transmitting that and moving them uh, to other surfaces that perhaps are not as dirty. So the thought of, of cleaning and disinfecting clean to dirty may be a foreign concept because it's kind of different than the way we look at, at things in a decontamination area like in central supply um, and, and other, uh, other such areas. So uh, oftentimes there then we want to, uh, we may kind of alter the flow. So a clean to dirty may not be intuitive to everybody. So, you know, make sure that your processes are, uh, um, are very clear. Also, we have to make sure that they know how to prevent the contamination of all solutions. So that means things like, you know, when you are cleaning a surface with your cloth, you don't take your dirty cloth and put it back in your bucket of clean germicide. Now, that again is not intuitive because that's not the way you clean at home. And I've had many, many people that will say, Ruth, quit telling me how to clean. I clean my house every day. And I tell them, well, I'm happy for you. But cleaning your house is not the same as cleaning a healthcare environment. So, you know, when Rome do as the Romans do, and I need you to think differently about this, I want you to forget how you clean your house, and I need you to start doing this in a separate way, a new way. So, again, it's not intuitive for people to change their cloth every time and uh, keep them from, uh, from contaminating their solutions. Also, they may need let them know when it is important to pre-clean before they disinfect. Things like if you have a big blob of body fluid, you know, get the fluid up before you begin the cleaning and disinfection process. So make sure that they know that you don't just take your mop when you're going to go clean up a blood spill and you don't just plop that mop right in the middle of that big blood spill. That there are different approaches to a removal of those bowel burdens. Also support the importance of good old fashioned elbow grease. That again, as I mentioned this morning, there is no silver bullet um, and no step that can let you leap over the removal of, physical removal of, of that bowel burden from the surface. So making sure that physical removal of soil is part of the process and that they know that just because you can see this little square area of a counter that appears soiled, that doesn't mean that you only clean that area. You clean the entire surface so that they understand that whole notion of physical removal. Again, make sure that they are very clear so they know contact time.
This becomes more and more important because in our Joint Commission visits, we know that our Joint Commission surveyors and our CMS surveyors are not interested in talking with leadership about what the practices are. They want to talk to the people that are performing the work. So your staff need to know what your policy says and what your institutional practice is about contact time. And they are able to convey that um, to the, the surveyors when asked. Put that in some sort of, of writing so that they have something to refer to. Because again, the Joint Commission wants to know what's your policy and are you sticking with your policy? So if you have this in writing, then individuals know what is expected of them and then they then can articulate um, the, the practice. Make sure that you're using the correct type of cleaning materials. So if you have an item that needs to have a certain type of material to clean that, whether it's a certain type of cloth or whatever that you have, if that is your expectation, you have to make sure that that's available and you have to make sure that your staff know what to use um, at any given time. All right, identify and report breaches in infection prevention. Now this becomes very important because we need to make sure that we can clearly differentiate between the employee who can't and the employee who won't, right? We handle those things very differently, right? Somebody that won't do, won't comply, I want to help them in every way possible to find the job of their dreams. And if they can't or they won't do what I need for them to do in this job, then they simply cannot stay in this job. Um, I tell them, your happiness means everything to me. So therefore, I need to make sure that you have a job that makes you happy because clearly this one doesn't, right? So help them. I'm going to help us by helping you, right? So I'm going to help the facility by helping you find the best job for you. If they can't do the job, that's a totally different set of circumstances, right? You need to understand what the barriers are, what is it that is keeping them from being able to do the job. Very different from somebody who won't. Is there something that interferes with their capabilities? Whether it's a physical issue, it could be something simple like, you know, don't tell someone who can't pass the color impairment test to only use the green item because maybe they can't tell you what the green item is. So make sure then that you have some process in your facility. If someone has problems with colors and color uh, differentiation is part of their job, you need to make sure that you know if they are unable to do that, or unable to do that. If they are unable to um, work with knobs or handles, if we have someone, if we have someone that is dealing with arthritis or some other issue, if they physically are unable, um, we may not be precluding them from working because of that physical inability, but we need to know how that is interfering with their capability. So we develop then the workaround process. We need to make sure that if they identify um, a correct or inappropriate practice that they know what to do. Can they identify when something is wrong? Do they feel that they are empowered and able? This may mean that you know, they say, well, I'm not going to tattle on my friend or my coworker. Well, you're not asking somebody to tattle. You're asking to let you know if there is something that is keeping someone from being able to do the right job. We're not asking them to judge, is this a can't or a won't? We're just saying it, it is, that it isn't, right? It isn't happening, and we need to know. We need to get that feedback. We also need to let them know that when they have the intuition that something is wrong and they don't know what it is, but they just feel that something is wrong, that there is a place for an intuitive approach. They're not sure what isn't going right, but something is keeping this from happening. Let them know that uh, everyone is empowered, that when there are those red flags, they may not know why it isn't right, but they know something is wrong, that there is a process to pick that up. There is the need to share knowledge, to share training, to share accountability, and to share responsibility. We are all working together, so we're all in this approach, and we have to make sure that everyone realizes they are part. And that our process for reporting uh, uh, breaches that are identified is clear, that they know who to call, and that we don't ever shoot the messenger, right? We want to know about these things, so these are people that you congratulate and you appreciate for letting you know about specific problems. All right, they need to know how to prevent infection in themselves and in others. So immunization is important. You are really play a leadership role in ensuring that your staff understand the safety of vaccines. 
and that we have vaccines available because it makes a difference in our safety and the safety of our patients. Uh, we have very clear directives from CDC regarding healthcare worker immunization. Every healthcare worker that comes in contact with blood or body fluids or that there is the potential or it can be reasonably anticipated during their job should be vaccinated against hepatitis B. Everybody that comes in contact with others in the workplace should be vaccinated against the measles, mumps, and rubella. That's their MMR vaccine. Everyone should be immune to chickenpox. You should either have had the disease or had the vaccine. Everyone should be immune. If you're going to come in contact with patients, you should be immune to whooping cough or pertussis. That means you should have had the new tetanus vaccine that also contains the pertussis component. You should also have a flu shot every year. Now, we know we have people that say, I don't like needles. I don't want a shot. Well, you're in luck. Because not only do we have the intranasal vaccine, if you are, are 49 or younger, but if you are older than 49, you also, we have a new influenza vaccine that is intradermal, just now this year. That means it's a shot with a needle that's 1.5 millimeters in length. That is hardly a needle. That is not even, that is smaller than a mosquito nose, right? So um, there is the new uh, delivery method, so people who don't like needles, uh, we can give intradermal. It goes in your upper arm. So it's not like a TB test. It's just a very small 1.5 millimeter needle that goes in your upper arm. So um, an excellent uh, a new addition to that armamentarium. We also need to make sure the healthcare workers know when they're supposed to stay home. Don't come to work sick. Don't come to work with a fever. Don't come to work with a fever and a cough. Don't come to work if you have an open or draining wound. Don't come to, to work if you've got diarrhea or you're vomiting. Okay. Now, we know that this is a challenge because what if somebody used up, maybe it's a new mom, she's got um, a couple of kids in uh, grade school, what she probably use her sick days for? Field trips or sick kids, right? So come time to actually use a sick day when she is sick, she may not have any, she may not be able to afford to have a day off without pay, she may come to work sick. 80% of our healthcare workforce is women, and that they are dealing with the responsibilities of child rearing. So recognize that and then figure out how you're going to approach this. But we cannot have people that are sick coming to work because then they transmit disease to their coworkers and they transmit disease to patients. We did some social networking um, investigation not too long ago. Um, who do you think the personnel are that have the most patient contact um, besides nursing? That's right. You are in more rooms, you come in contact with more patients than anyone else. So if you are sick, you have the potential to transmit illness uh, to a greater number of patients than anybody else. So we've got to depend on you to know when to stay home. We also need you to protect yourselves and make sure that you know what it means when we're talking about standard precautions. It's just more than not getting stuck by a needle. It's not getting coughed on. It's not getting splashed or sprayed on. It's not coming, it's not touching fluids that you don't know what they are unless you have on barrier protection. So making sure your personnel know when to use PPE and especially when to perform hand hygiene. They also know, need to know that it's okay to ask for help and ask for information. So who are the people that are trusted, credible sources for them and where do they go to? Make sure that you maintain communication uh, uh, openly, but also that there is a respect for privacy, both from uh, supervisors that they may be talking with, but also they need to know that um, there is the need for privacy if they know something about another employee, that there certainly are privacy issues, but if they know something that may impact the safety of the patient, their responsibility is to the patient. Right? So they need to know, who do I come to with I ha if I have information that needs to be shared or if I'm concerned about the safety of the patient. All right, let's go back to our 64-year-old guy. 64-year-old male that was admitted to your facility. He's the one that had MRSA. He went in the private room. Uh, many family members are, are visiting. So I want you to think about these elements of the bundle that we just talked about. Selecting and using PPE, correct type of technique, the use of, um, of um, infection prevention breach involvement, uh, communication, um, critical thinking skills. Um, have the bundle addre elements address the needs of this patient. And you think about that. 
can somebody think of something that may involve this patient that we haven't talked about? I can think of one thing, and that's, um, I think, involved not only in leadership, but also uh, monitoring the effect of, of our work. Um, leadership is, uh, is vital. You have to, uh, obviously, because uh, you are here, I think that that indicates that you are a leader in this field. You have to not only know how to ensure others can do the job, you need to make sure that you are able to do the job yourselves. Um, therefore, if you perform the job yourself, you will know what it takes to get that task done. So your role includes enabling others to do the job, identifying challenges or barriers that prevent them from being successful. It involves evaluating not only the task itself, but how well people are able to do the job. Uh, you promote the standard of cleanliness and disinfection in your facility. You also promote the standards of individual accountability. So if you maintain accountability for yourself, you demand that in others, then you are much more likely to ensure that the work is done uh, by your coworkers and by those that report to you. You've got to provide feedback because you have to let people know how well they are doing and enable them to improve. Again, if you never provide feedback, um, then people will never know what the expectation is. But I would caution you also that it's important that we take that sandwich approach. If you've got something bad to tell someone, it's nice if you can sandwich it in between good things, okay? Let someone know what they are doing well, what they need to improve on, and then something else that they were doing well, if at all possible. It does not dilute that middle item that you are telling them, but it lets them know that they are capable of correct behavior and correct activity. And it also lets them know that you don't only hone in on the negative, that you also um, uh, uh, congratulate them on the positive. Now, I mentioned monitoring. We talked a little bit about this this morning, that we have to have an approach for monitoring the effectiveness of our job that exceeds simply just a visual check. Does the room look clean or not? We know that you can't always tell if a room has been appropriately disinfected just simply by sticking your head in and seeing if the floor is shiny and the countertop looks clean, that we have to have a little bit more of an enhanced approach. We talked this morning about um, a number of the technologies that are being used now. We use a fluorescent powder um, to determine whether some high-touch high, uh, surfaces have actually been touched. Uh, when we do this, I uh, just want to share a little bit of experience that I had in a way that I think that you shouldn't do it, and that was the way that I approached it. Uh, that when we first started using this, um, I thought it would be a great idea, um, and we just did it. We just said, okay, you know, in infection prevention, we're going to go out, we're going to be putting this uh, uh, glow germ, we just used the regular glow germ, mixed it ourselves like a little, like Granny Clampett and her home brew, so I put it out on high-touch surfaces, and then um, I went back around with the environmental services supervisor and said, you know, I, I put this powder in the room, and now we're going to go back, and I want you to walk with me and look and see how well we did in cleaning the room. Well, because I took that approach that was threatening to her, um, she felt like I was going behind her back and trying to make her look bad and, and undermining her activity, and how easily I could have changed what was really a very negative thing into something that was positive. So think about what your approach is going to be, and I didn't consider how I would have felt if somebody had done that with me. So if I had started maybe from a different place in that, to say that we're gonna start evaluating the effectiveness of work, and we're gonna look beyond what appears to be clean, that we're gonna actually put in some markers that will help us provide some objective evaluation of the effectiveness. How much better I would have done, and had I engaged them to say, where do you think of the high touch surfaces? Help me figure out how to make this um, happen, and then how we should um, use the information that we find. Um, instead, I decided all, all on my own I was gonna do this, and I've really damaged relationships, and it took me a long time to uh, regain not only that trust, but that credibility. So I just wanted to share that with you so you don't go down the same pathway that I did if you are working with your staff, that you know there is some sensitivity involved that I didn't do it. If we have these advanced programs, it gives us um, better data that we can use to evaluate practice. It helps orient the performance. That is, we're not looking at anything other than 
did you clean this surface? So we're not making any judgments and we're taking any ambiguity out of our evaluation. It allows us to evaluate in an ongoing manner too. So we can set up a process where, you know, instead of always looking at the doorknob, we're gonna be switching surfaces periodically. So we can ensure that somebody understands the total picture of that room. And it helps us Instead of looking at the person, remember I said this morning, we got to separate the person from the problem. The problem is the cleanliness of the environment. So we're not talking about any one person. We're saying, how do we make sure that this environment meets certain thresholds for cleanliness? And we're doing that by enabling us to use this enhanced evaluation program. So it takes a lot of the upset out of it, helps it take it from a personal level to a much more objective level. There are limitations to this. You know, it's a lot easier to use a conventional method where we just walk in the room uh, and eyeball it and walk out, um, but it doesn't give us the best effect. Uh, that sort of uh, process doesn't. But if we're using something that's enhanced, that's a new procedure. And it does take time for people to get to know the procedure. So we have to introduce it. We have to make sure that support is there. We have to do that background relationship building uh, that I mentioned. Think about what the resistance may be to accepting that. So do your homework uh, before you get involved in this. But the take home message for this is we just have to move away from just a very simple visual evaluation. We're gonna to have to do something differently. I don't know that we have all the answers. I know that uh, if we use and if we look at some of the methods, they may be um, expensive. You may not be able to justify that. So we have to figure out where can we get in that right place uh, to evaluate the effectiveness. But simply visual monitoring and just thinking intuitively that we know what has been cleaned and disinfected is probably not in the best interest of our patients. So we have to figure out a new approach. Do that collaboratively, but move in that uh, direction. I put this up, uh, not that I expect you to actually see it, but the, the idea is uh, embrace that whole idea of checklists so that you know what you need to look at, uh, be checking it off, be evaluating that, um, use that, borrow tools and resources from each other, uh, find the best thing that works for you, don't be afraid to get out on the internet and find a tool somebody's used and then change it for yourself, because in healthcare, it's not a competition for patient safety, right? Everybody is in this race together, so um, collaborate and network with each other, try to identify resources that each other are using, be willing to share. If you have something that you're doing very well, please share it with others because you know if you were struggling with that problem, there are probably many others uh, that are struggling as well. Use these sorts of, of tools and resources to take back to your infection prevention and control committee. How many of you are on, are a member in your infection prevention and control committee? So that's excellent. So you know that not only are you a member, but there shouldn't be any approach that's like free lunch. So you don't get, just get to go to the meeting and eat and leave and never say a thing. That You should have definite homework and you should be an active participant and that means taking information back. Let them know what the processes are for monitoring. Let them know what you're, how you are evaluating and what you are, are changing. And then make sure that you are integrating leadership into the whole process. We know that you're not alone, that not only do we need environmental services in, the, uh, in this approach, but we've got to figure out who are our other partners. Materials management may be involved in you know, helping order, maybe even setting rules. Maybe you're part of a, the group purchase uh, organization that is limiting your ability to purchase certain types of items. Well, you need to be including materials management then in some of your decision making because you may need a product or an item or equipment or service that isn't on your list. Maybe you need to go off of that for some reason. Use your data, use your evaluative methods to help then uh, prove your case. Make sure that we're connecting well with not only our C-suite, and that is, you know, our CEO, CFO, CNO, that's the C-suite, those people those, whose titles started with the chief of something, but include those from engineering and other practice areas. And I mentioned the Infection Control Committee, and this is just an example of something that that we put together that if you are going to be responsible on a committee, you need to know what your responsibility is. So we, we worked with environmental services and others to come up with their infection control report. So what type of items and what type of information do we need from you? So for example, we need to know, has there been any change in the hospital germicide or the healthcare facility products that are being used to clean and disinfect? Um, is there anything that you're looking at? Is there a proposed change? Because we 
we need to talk about this before it happens because there can be unintended consequences and we need to be aware of those and be prepared. Are you going to be changing a cleaning process? Are you going to be moving from some kind of a, a manual uh, process to something automated or vice versa? If so, bring this to the committee so that um, everyone is aware. Um, is there some kind of a report um, regarding the alcohol hand rub usage? Are you evaluating how much product is being used? Are you looking at the sharps containers? So some type of product or service that is under your umbrella. Um, be Provide, be prepared to provide some kind of evaluation about how is it going so that there is a record of the activity somewhere. If you are monitoring something, make sure that you have that you're using this, uh, this time to actually report that and keep record and keep track of it. If there is something else going on, if you have noticed persistent breaches in infection prevention, this is a time to document it so uh, there is an ongoing record of activity. And so those that may be in attendance in that meeting may have the power to help change that. So use that as a time um, to get your point across and to be, be able to uh, then perhaps elicit additional support. If you are able to demonstrate ongoing problems that have a particular implication with staffing, this is an excellent time to figure out a way to monitor and to document that. For example, you may use this report to uh, begin to um, uh, monitor the number of FTEs that you have. What are the number of FTEs that you have? What are your vacant FTEs? What, is your, what are your problems to actually filling those? Maybe what your turnover rate is? Something that will help continue to link your uh, practices in your, your department with some sort of an undesirable outcome. So in this instance, it's infection. So how can you use this committee uh, to support your efforts and improve your, your approaches? So again, when we looked at our bundle elements, the initial bundle elements that we want to uh, uh, present for your feedback include the following. Selecting, mixing, and using the correct germicide according to your policy. Identification of surfaces and items that are in need of cleaning and disinfection. Selecting and using PPE according to facility policy. Cleaning and disinfecting surfaces using correct techniques identifying and reporting breaches in infection prevention, and preventing infection in self and others. So are there additions that you want to add? Um, we'll get to, to opportunities to share for that in a moment. Again, think about tools and resources that are available, and there are a number of them. The, certainly the practice guidance uh, that we have for environmental cleaning. We have checklists and graphs that you all, I'm sure, are maintaining, so share those with each other. And then I, I put the web address for the CDC's toolkit that is there for evaluating environmental cleaning. I think that that's a, a nice um, website for you to go to and take a look and see if there are items that you can use um, and, again, repurpose uh, for, for your uh, activities.